Mute on. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar where we'll talk about some of the tax changes in the recently enacted Tax Cut and Jobs Act um, as they specifically apply to technology, communication, and life sciences company. Today we'll talk about primarily the implications that affect corporate taxpayers, um, with one exception for a big change for some flow-through entities. We won't talk about um, a bunch of excise tax provisions or some or telecom-specific regulated implications, um, nor will we talk much about individual implications. There's a lot of information in this bill, but today we want to focus primarily on those um, business uh, implications. Um, also, today we won't be offering CPE, so, um, as we wanted to get this information out as quickly as possible so that companies can plan for their uh, closing 2017 and for and for planning for 2018. Um, during, the, um, during the presentation at any time, if you have any questions, um, you can use the Q&A function um, in the upper right-hand corner. Um, we'll um, likely just accumulate those uh, questions and answer them towards the end so we make sure we get through any information. Um, if there's some that are timely and very specific, we will um, address them as we go along. Um, if we don't get through them all, we'll follow up um, with specific uh, responses. So joining me today um, is Eric Rohner, a tax partner in our San Diego office, Roy Deaver, an international tax partner out of our Seattle office, uh, Sung Yu, uh, tax partner out of our Silicon Valley office, and Kunal Patel, uh, Senior Manager out of our Silicon Valley office. My name's Rich Krogan, I'm a partner here in San Francisco, and I head up our firm's uh, in, uh, technology, communication, life science tax practice. Our agenda for today, um, uh, we'll start off, we'll talk about corporate taxes and credits. Um, as many people have heard, there are some significant changes there. Um, we'll also talk about changes to the net operating losses uh, going forward. Um, the one exception to the, to the corporate uh, focus today, um, there's a new pass-through business deduction available to pass-through entities. Um, that's a really significant change, so we'll spend some time talking about that. Um, we'll talk about uh, potential changes uh, related to the deductibility of research expenses, um, interest expenses, and bonus depreciation. Uh, We'll also talk about some compensation and benefits issues that have caught the attention of a number of clients. Um, um, we'll also spend some time uh, going over at a high level some, some of the impacts on international activities. Um, we don't have enough time uh, within an hour to go into these changes very deeply. Um, we will be having other uh, webinars and information on on these significant changes. And if you do have international activities, um, I, I would recommend that you um, attend one of the, the future webinars or, or, or reach out to your advisors. Um, also, a big due to all these changes in the tax law, um, there's going to be some significant changes um, in companies' financial statements uh, and their tax provision calculations. So we will talk about some of the considerations companies should consider when calculating their uh, tax provision, uh, deferred tax assets, um, and disclosures. Uh, lastly, we'll touch a bit on state tax uh, considerations. Uh, this is a federal act. It doesn't directly impact um, most states, but some states automatically follow federal law. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the things to consider um, from, from a state-level taxation perspective. So the First topic for today, uh, we just wanted to do a quick overview of the changes on the corporate tax rate um, and some of the credit implications. Um, as many have heard, the corporate tax rate was reduced from 35% to 21%. Uh, the 21% rate is a flat rate, um, uh, and it is effective January 1st, 2018. So if you're a fiscal year filer, you will be subject to a blended rate. You'll have to calculate you know, the, the tax um, 
you'll have be a, a tax rate somewhere between 35 and 21 percent. Um, the corporate AMT has been repealed uh, for years uh, beginning um, in 2018 and after. Um, and if you do have AMT credit carry forwards, um, those will be refundable. The credit provisions, many of the credit uh, provisions were repealed in exchange for the lower flat 21% rate. Um, however, the research credit was retained, and that's of particular um, interest and benefit for uh, most of the people in today's audience. Um, also for our life science uh, companies and friends out there, um, the orphan drug credit was, uh, was retained, although at a little reduced benefit, um, but still helpful. Um, net operating losses. Um, there are some changes here. Uh, the net operating losses in the future is limited to 80% of taxable income in the carry forward year. Um, and it is effective for losses beginning after 2018. Um, uh, any losses arising in years 2017 and prior can still be utilized to offset 100% of taxable income in the carry forward year. So if you have income in 2019 and you use 2017 losses, you can offset that all the way to zero. If you have to use 2018 losses to offset that 2019 income, you can only offset 80% of that taxable income. Uh, additionally, uh, the two-year NOL carryback period has been repealed, um, um, and but um, in a positive development, um, NOLs can be carried forward indefinitely um, rather than just the 20 years. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, who's going to um, tell us all about some of the this new pass-through business deduction. Eric. Uh, thank you, Rich, uh, and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> As Rich mentioned, another flagship uh, component um, of, this, of, the, of the new tax act, besides the 21% corporate tax rate, uh, is the pass-through deduction. The pass-through deduction was designed to allow non-corporate businesses to also participate in the lower tax rate. Uh, Section 199A provides for a deduction equal to 20% of certain domestic qualifying income, uh, known as qualified business income or QBI. The 20% deduction applies to certain pass-through businesses such as sole proprietorships, S corporations, partnerships, including trust and estates, uh, as well as dividend income from REIT. The current domestic activities production deduction, acti domestic production activities deduction, uh, known as the DPAD, uh, as it was known. Uh, which was focused on domestic manufacturing is, is now repealed after 2017. The QBI deduction is limited for taxpayers providing professional services, which include medical services, uh, law, accounting, actuarial science, performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, and brokerage services. In a last minute change uh, that, that made it into the, into the final tax law, uh, engineers and architects were excluded from the limitation. That is to say that they, they're, they're allowed, that service is allowed for claiming the deduction. The idea there was that these services are more directly connected to ca capital investment um, or infrastructure improvements, and, um, and so they got the little carve out. Um, it should be noted that for professional services, all professional services are limited if, if their taxable income is less than the threshold amount. And the threshold amount is $315,000 for married filing jointly and $157,000 for all other taxpayers. And this, this uh, deduction, once you get over the threshold, the deduction begins to phase out. Um, and for married filing jointly, the phase out is over $100,000 for, so at $415,000, the deduction is fully phased out. And $50,000 uh, for taxpayers other than married filing jointly. It should be noted so also that any service is, is qualified uh, for taxable income uh, less than the threshold amount. After that, deduction is phased out, as I noted above. The deduction is also allowed for regular tax and AMT tax. Uh, 
and the deduction does not apply to net investment income under Section 1411 or self-employment taxes. So you can't take the deduction to reduce your 1411 or self-employment taxes. And the QBI deduction will expire for tax years uh, beginning after December 31st, 2025. QBI is defined as the net amount of qualified items of income gain, deduction, and loss with respect to any qualified trade or business of the taxpayer. Interest, dividends, and capital gains are excluded. That is, QBI is income without those items. Earned income such as salaries and guaranteed payments from partnerships are also excluded. Income must be effectively connected with the U.S. trade or business, so it generally must be a domestic uh, business and domestic income. There's also a provision for carryover of losses. If the, if the QBI produces a loss, that loss is carried over uh, and will be treated as a loss in the succeeding taxable year. The full 20% deduction is generally available with, with a few limitations. The first limitation is a, is a W-2 li limitation that, uh, that limits the deduction to 50% of, uh, of W-2 compensation. However, the limitation does not apply for taxpayers who are below the threshold amount. Again, the threshold amount is taxable income of $315,000 for married filing jointly and $157,500 for all other taxpayers. So if you're below the threshold amount, uh, you don't need to have wages, and you can still claim the deduction. There is an alternate W-2 and asset-based limitation. Um, that limitation is 25% of W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of qualified property. And qualified property is property, uh, any property using a trade or business subject to depreciation. The purpose of this alternate rule is to provide a deduction for interest in entities that are mostly capital intensive but do not have significant wages. Uh, and you think about that, and what does that include? Uh, real estate partnerships and other flow through activities. As the limitations based on unadjusted basis, depreciation does not affect the amount of the deduction. Um, another significant change uh, is in connection with research and development expenditures. And beginning in 2022, uh, specified U.S. research expenses, expenses um, and specifically IRC Section 174 costs, uh, must be capitalized and amortized rapidly over a five-year period. Um, before this new tax, uh, before tax reform, taxpayers had the option of either expensing or capitalizing those research and, and development costs. Now they have to be uh, capitalized and amortized but that doesn't start until after 2022. I'm sorry, beginning in 2022. Um, expenses attributable to research conducted outside the U.S. are amortized over a 15-year period. Specified expenses do not include expenditures for land or depreciable property, but do include related depreciation allowances. If property is disposed, retired, or abandoned during the amortization period, basis is not recovered. It must be amortized over the remaining uh, period. So you can't churn the property to accelerate the deduction. Application of the new uh, rule is treated as a change of an accounting method under Section 41 um, if your current method is to expense those costs. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to now turn that time over to some you. Thanks, Eric. Um, we've covered a lot of materials, but um, you know, please bear with us. Um, we're going to talk about interest expense, bonus depreciation, and some compensation-related changes in the next uh, minute, a uh, couple minutes. So interest expense, uh, capital infusion, debt, um, it, um, raise is always a big concern and issue for technology companies. And there are some additional provisions like you know, we want our um, clients and friends to think about. So. Interest in, under the previous tax law, if you think about the accrual method taxpayers or cash method taxpayers, you know, as long as those are um, paid, typically you would allow a deduction unless like, there are certain exceptions um, applied. Um, for example, uh, earnings stripping provision in 163J, uh, it looked to several testings, include the debt to equity ratio, 
um, whether there was a disqualified interest existence to that instrument, and 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 more so that than whether uh, the the interest itself was an excess interest and. And how did they compute the excess interest? They brought in the concept of adjusted taxable income, which equates similar to the EBITDA. Now, the new act, similar to 163J, you know, basically it broadens the, the, the scope of 163J to cover um, all debts. So all U.S. domestic corporations or a foreign invested subsidiary of, um, in the U.S., would be uh, applied to this new interest deduction limitation. But however, um, for certain small businesses, there are exceptions. You have to look back your three years average um, gross receipts, and if that amounts are less than 25 million, uh, you, will, you will be exempt from interest expense limitation computation. So the key point here is there are timing components that to think about in you know, how the new provision defines adjusted taxable income. So beginning uh, 1 1 2018 through um, uh, 2022, the adjusted taxable income uh, for purpose of interest limitation comparison would be 30% against your similar EBITDA. But starting beginning 2022, that limitations comparison would be even narrower. So um, in, in that situation, it would be compared to earnings before interest and tax expenses only. Um, the disallowed interest, you don't lose it permanently. Um, you can carry forward indefinitely. So basically, you would have a suspended deduction, and that deductions would be always been in comparison to your adjusted taxable income. So some of the things that you know we want our audience to think about is you know certain other new tax act they might have had um, grandfathering or transition periods, but for this particular interest expense limitation cla clauses, it applies immediately starting one one twenty eighteen, and all previously existing debts are not grandfathered in. So. Um, Please take a look at your um, debt situation, your forecast taxable income projections, and we highly recommend to do some cash flow analysis to see whether there will be a significant impact. Now, in, in technology sector, uh, mergers and acquisition activities has been, um, you know, rising. And a lot of times in those contexts, we've seen a lot of debt financing or debt assumptions as a part of a transaction, and due to this interest expense limitation, there might be some additional considerations that the buyer or the purchaser should think about um, how that would impact your overall purchase consideration due to this limitation. Now, and, and also another provision that uh, something that ties to this interest de uh, deduction limitation is purpose of ownership change rules. As you know, that there is an ownership change rules under IRC 382. So for purposes of the pre-ownership pre change losses testing, the disallowed interest carry forward should be part of that. So it, it's suspended. However, for purpose of 382 testing purposes, it's part of that limitation consideration. So let's talk about bonus depreciation. So for bonus depreciation, um, this, this is an extension to what's available currently. So for changes made in bonus depreciation, um, be mindful that this is a temporary allowance provisions that increases the current bonus depreciation of 50% to 100%, um, different from other provisions where the effective uh, period would be 1-1-2018, for bonus depreciation, uh, you, you can start taking into that account in Q4 of 2017 for calendar year company um, through end of 22. And after end of 22, beginning 2023, there will be a five-year phase-down, so from 100% bonus depreciation for first-year properties 
uh, 20% decline each year. So by 2027, uh, there will be 0% allowance for the bonus depreciation. And it applies for both used and a new property, but it might not be applicable to qualified leasehold improvement property. In addition, um, there are modifications to 179 expensing. So 179 expensing is separate from a bonus depreciation. So that limitation is from $500,000 taxable income to a million dollar. So there will be some uplift where you can expense it up to that amount. And in this case, a qualified leasehold uh, improvements um, should be taken into account. So some of the observation on the bonus depreciation changes were um, this is this is similar to like you know what we have seen in the past of the sunset clause so called. So you know whether that starting period of um, you know, 20% decline would actually occur during those period. You know, we might want to wait and see and what that what that would look like. Um, so that's kind of one thing that we um, wanted to think about. The second thing is since there is an available options to take 100% a bonus depreciation starting on your 2017 tax return for your calendar year taxpayers, um, think about the benefit of taking 100% uh, to preserve NOL if you if you are in law situation versus um, if you take that depreciation in future years um, that means you would have 80% limitation of NOL right so the balancing act um, should be part of your consideration but you can still elect to do the 50% bonus depreciation so that could be uh, something to think about as well. Moving on to compensation matters, um, we're going to talk about provisions that's applicable for privately held companies, publicly uh, traded companies, and um, the wider spectrum of uh, all companies that, uh, with regards to fringe benefits. And with regards to compensations, there are still some gray areas that we would, we anticipate the clarifications would be made. And um, starting 2018, um, we expect to see IRS issuing more um, procedures and notices and how these provisions would really apply. So let's talk about qualified equity grants. So, you know, this provision is applicable to uh, illiquid companies, um, such as the privately held VC venture-backed um, growth companies, but it won't be applicable to the publicly traded companies. Uh, the provision applies and provides an opportunity to employees to participate to defer their income when there is a taxable event of their equity compensation um, for non-qualified stock options. That would be the, when those options are exercised. For restricted stock units, it would be when the vesting would occur, for example. But one caveat to think about is it's a form of election. Um, so, so when, when that taxable event occurs, the tax is locked in on that price where that event occurs. So if the company's intrinsic value of the stock price declines during that deferral period, there could be some negative consequences where your, your tax liability or taxable income is fixed in the year when that taxable event occurs. So, you know, this is something that, you know, the employees might consider whether they would want to make that election when that tax, taxable event occurs. And it's a broad-based provision, so um, our understanding is 80% of employee uh, need to participate or it has to be offered to them. And certain individuals would be excluded for purpose of participating to qualified equity grants. And those would be a 1% owner of the company, the CEO, CFO, and top four compensated officers. I think the, the intent was truly give it to the employee and an option, um, you know, to, to defer their income, you know, while the company is in the growth mode. So from, from employer's perspective, a couple things to think about. Um, 
it applies to income deferral. So from a FICA purposes, you know, there will be no deferral. So as a part of your payroll processing, um, that should be considered. There will be new W-2 reporting requirement, employer no employee notification requirement. Um, so those things has to be all considered if you were to uh, adopt this plan as a part of your uh, equity compensation packages. Now, moving on to uh, 162M provision. So different from the previous um, qualified grants, the 162M applies to publicly traded companies. Uh, talking about the old rule, the old rule, um, it the provision limits the available deductions to the corporation for compensations paid to the covered employees. And um, so the limitation was on a $1 million threshold. And in computing that $1 million threshold, there were a couple planning opportunities that the company um, used. Um, for example, um, the performance-based uh, stock option grants were excluded if you meet certain criteria and um, follow through the rules. And also, for the covered employees, the covered employees would only um, be applicable for those that are employed at the last day of the tax year. So, for example, um, if you had a retiring CEO of a publicly traded company and he you know, resigns a day before of a tax year close and receives a retirement packages and deferred compensation, for purpose of 162M testing, it was outside of scope. So the new law uh, appears to attempt to eliminate some of these opportunities and also expand the definition of covered employees. So um, the new 162M revision takes out the performance-based exceptions. Um, it expands the definition of covered employee inclu to include CFOs. Um, and then there is this so-called once you're covered employee, always going to be covered employee. So what that means is um, once during the year you are part of that pool of a covered employee testing, even in future years um, for purpose of 162M testing, as long as you receive some remunerations or compensations from the publicly traded company, um, your testing pool would be increased. So. Each year, um, when you're doing tax return analysis, provision analysis, you know, there might be some tracking mechanism to see like, you know, who were covered in previous years and who are still receiving uh, compensation needs to be tested. Now, there are transition relief and grandfathering of the old compens compensatory arrangements. And so the testing, the cutoff date is November 2nd. So the, the rule looks at you know, if the packages were in effect before November 2nd, um, you know, for purpose of this revised 162M purposes, it would be outside and the old rule would be still applicable. So an example would be, um, you know, the covered employee, um, you know, had a stock option plan grants and those options were already, um, you know, part, it were in effect so that won't be qualified. Uh, that won't be applicable for 162M testing purposes. However, uh, the employee, covered employee, joins the company in, in Q3, but actual grant and physical transfer of the agreement occurs in no, outside of November 2nd, then most likely those new grants would be part of this new 162M limitation. Now, for growth companies and technology companies that when uh, public uh, last, you know, two, three years, you know, there were so provisions that's available for IPO relief. So, for example, um, you know, there were provisions says, you know, to the extent of this, you know, equity compensations, um, it won't be subject to 162M limitation uh, in general for first three years after the year of IPO year. Um, but you know the new revision is silent on that. Um, we, my my personal thinking is I think that provision is still applicable and available. But we might have to wait and see what the uh, whether there will be a further clarification on that IPO relief. 
Other compensation matters, uh, we'll touch several of them. Um, in general, um, some of the costs that you're paying um, can be considered as a fringe benefit, and it allows companies to take those deductions. Depending upon certain fringe benefits, it's either excluded or included um, to employees as a taxable income. And the chart below this page and the next pages talks about some of the changes uh, in comparison to the uh, what was in effect and what the changes would look like. So, for example, entertainment expenses, uh, the, under the previous law, you know, 50% deductible. So, you, in your tax return, you would have an M1 adjustment to entertainment expenses, but going forward, um, it's going to be 100% um, limited. So if, if you are a company that spends a lot of expenses on entertainment, um, there will be an uh, immediate impact. For meals, um, this is very common um, for our technology industries that, you know, um, employer-operated facilities and for convenience of employees, uh, a lot of companies um, provide meals and beverages. Um, these expenses were 100% uh, deductible historically, but now, um, you know, there will be a limitation for 50%. And after 2025, uh, it would be not deductible permanently. So that expense is also a large expense to carry for technology companies. Um, so there will be uh, an adjustment to your taxable income. Now, with regards to trans transportation fringe benefits, uh, previously it was deductible to employer, but it will be no longer deductible, but still the exclusions would apply to employee. Um, so employee still gets a benefit, but employer loses the benefit. For moving cost, um, th there will be a suspension. So from 2018 to 2025, uh, the moving expenses will be now uh, non-deductible, and also it has to be includable to employees' wages. Okay. For um, employee achievement awards, that one is not really in revision, but there were some uh, interpretations, open interpretations as to what was considered employee achievement awards and what was not considered achievement awards, but there were clarifications made to what was considered employee achievement awards. As you can see, um, you know, because of this um, clarification, now some of these employee achievement awards would be part of includable gross income to employees. The last one, bicycle commuting reimbursements, um, you know, it used to be excludable for income to employees, but now those are repealed. Um, it's going to—it's no longer excludable um, by the employee. So, you know, these are some of the things that we saw on the fringe benefits changes. Um, you know, if we hear more things about, um, we would definitely communicate back to our audiences and our friends and clients. Um, so that's all I have on the compensation side. And now I'll turn it to Roy, who would cover the international side. Thanks, Sung. So today we're going to talk at a high level about the changes on the international tax side. We will be hosting a more robust international tax discussion next week on the 16th, a one-hour webcast covering all the international changes in the, the Tax Act. Uh, a lot of the changes that we've been talking about today, we've noted that they're going to take effect on 1118. However, there are some international changes that will affect 2017 tax returns. So under the prior law, the U.S. Wor uh, operated on a worldwide tax system. Generally, the U.S. was taxed on all of its worldwide income, and to the extent that it paid any foreign taxes, it received a tax credit for taxes paid to those countries. However, earnings from foreign subsidiaries were deferred from tax until those earnings were repatriated back to the U.S. When that happened, the U.S. shareholder would receive dividend, would recognize dividend income, and if that shareholder was a C corporation, then they would get a credit for any underlying taxes paid by the foreign subsidiary to mitigate that double tax burden. Uh, 
Uh, additionally, the U.S. then also had a subpart F regime, which was a backstop to this deferral concept to counteract any perceived abuses within the system. Under the new law now, the U.S. is generally still on a worldwide system, but there's some changes that reduce the tax on certain foreign earnings. And now, you know, it's generally being referred to as a territorial system. However, I'd put the term territorial in quotation marks. Uh, there are some benefits that are going to be available to C corporations on, uh, in the new act, namely the exemption system with respect to dividends from foreign subsidiaries and the new foreign uh, direct intangible income, which we'll discuss in more detail in a little bit. The subpart F regime was generally retained. However, it has been expanded, and again, we'll talk about that expansion in, in a little bit. In order to pay for the cost of moving to the territorial system, there is a one-time toll charge uh, on the transition for any deferred earnings that have not yet been subject to U.S. tax. So as I said, the, the U.S. now has an exemption for foreign dividends. There are some requirements in order to meet this. The, the first is that the you must, first is that it's only available to C corporations. The second is that, that foreign subsidiary must be held at least 10% or more of its stock. Uh, you have to hold it for more than a year. And that ownership period isn't measured on the date that the dividend is paid. It's just that uh, there's a, a look back and a look forward so that you have held the stock for at least one year, but you can pay a dividend before you meet that one-year holding period as long as you still meet the one year in total. And finally, the dividend must not be a hybrid dividend, and that is there must not be a deduction or tax benefit in the foreign country upon payment of the dividend. So as we said, the, there's a, some new rules on the taxation of income generated from intangible property. And those act in concert with each other and are calculated in a similar manner. However, there's some benefits that are available only for C corporations on these provisions. The first of these provisions is what's called uh, the Global Intangible Low Tax Income, or GILTI. And this is a new subpart F uh, category of income that imposes a U.S. tax on foreign earnings that are, one, not attributable to tangible depreciable assets, and two, are subject to a low rate of tax in the foreign country. So in this case, as the, the way that the provisions work out, the, if the earnings are paid or the earnings are subject to less than an effective rate of 13.125% in the foreign jurisdiction, there'll be a net U.S. income inclusion, provided that the U.S. company can claim foreign tax credits associated with that income. Now, if it's a loss company, uh, in the U.S. And, and is not otherwise paying tax for which it can claim credits, then that income would be recognized and those credits would uh, be available for use in future years. Similarly, as I said, there's also the foreign derived intangible income. And what this does is it allows a deduction for C corporations for sales, revenue, or royalty income for that's earned outside the U.S. and again is not attributable to tangible depreciable assets. And this reduces the U.S. tax burden on this type of income uh, that's derived outside of the U.S. but earned by a U.S. company. And again, this effectively gets down to a rate of approximately 13.125%. The issue, though, is that there may be some challenges to this provision from the World Trade Organization. So we'll have to wait and see uh, what are the long-term implications of this new uh, deduction that's available. The other uh, piece on taxation is the base erosion anti-abuse tax, or the BEAT provisions. And so while we talked earlier about AMT being repealed for corporations, that was the general AMT system that had been in place for, for a while. However, the BEAT provisions does impose a new AMT, but only on large corporations. And that is any U.S. company whose average revenue over the prior three years was at least $500 million or higher and who are making deductible payments to foreign related parties where those expenses equal at least 3% of their total deductions taken on their tax return. In that case, if both of those criteria are met, then that U.S. corporation 
has to recalculate its taxable income, taking out those deductible payments, and then apply a new tax rate to that revised amount to figure out what its beat amount is. And then the taxpayer would pay the higher of the two, whether it's the, the new tax calculated under the beat or the tax calculated under the general tax system. That rate starts at 5% for the 2018 tax, tax year and then increases the 10% from uh, 2019 to 2025, and then it increases further after that. And then finally, there was some discussion about limitations to uh, existing rules under subpart F for Section 956, which is an investment in U.S. property, and both of these rules trigger deemed dividends from foreign subsidiaries. And again, these provisions were retained in the final bill. They were not uh, removed as they were in the separate House and Senate bills. So on the deemed repatriation of foreign earnings, again, this is the, the toll tax that's going to occur on 2017 tax returns and, and may also be uh, included on 2018 returns as well, depending on the, the year end of both the, the U.S. company as well as the year ends of their foreign subsidiaries if, if those year ends differ. So as we discussed, there was a system of deferral that was in place other than the subpart F provisions, but because those earnings have, yet, have not yet been subject to U.S. tax, they are now in order to provide the exemption that's available in future years on dividend income. And even though this exemption is only available to C corporations, every taxpayer has to pay the transition tax uh, if they own any foreign subsidiaries. And so what this is, it's a one, again, it's a one-time tax calculation that's treated as a new category of subpart F income. And it's based on the earnings that have been accumulated outside of the U.S. since 1986. And then there's a tax rate that's applied to those earnings based on whether those earnings have been, are being held in cash or cash equivalents, uh, which would be a cash, short-term investments, uh, and accounts, net accounts receivable. And to the extent that the earnings are held in those sorts of assets, the tax rate, the effective tax rate on that is 15.5%. And, and the rest is subject to a rate of 8%. Uh, there's a two measurement dates. So you take the greater of the earnings on either of the two dates, which are either November 2nd or December 31st, 2017. Uh, taxpayers are then able to uh, elect to defer the tax on that to the extent that they're going to pay the tax over eight years. And that eight-year deferral is backloaded into the last three years. So the first five years of the deferral, only 8% of the tax is due. And then in years six, seven, and eight, it's 15, 20, and 25% of the tax. Uh, this will apply to any uh, foreign corporations that are owned at least 10% or more. Uh, and if you're an S corporation, you actually have a special deferral rule that allows you to uh, defer that tax, defer the start of when that tax may be due into the future uh, until there's a triggering event, uh, such as losing S corporation status or shareholders selling their shares in the S corporation. So in calculation of uh, the amount, there's what we kind of view as a, a seven-step process to determine the amount. And again, the first installment of this is going to be due with the, uh, the, the time of the extension of the 2017 tax return. So if you're a calendar year taxpayer, that first amount, uh, which is going to be 8% of the total liability, is going to be due on April 16th of this year. So the first item is to identify uh, what are the last years of the foreign corporation? So again, this is important if that foreign subsidiary has a different year end than the U.S. company. Uh, then calculate the amount of the earnings and profits that have been accumulated offshore. Uh, apply the U.S. company's ownership percentage to those amounts. Uh, you're then also allowed to reduce uh, the positive earnings amounts from foreign subsidiaries by any uh, foreign entities that have accumulated losses, so you're allowed to do some netting there to help reduce the amount of that burden. Then you figure out the amount that's going to be subject to the 
Uh, once that's determined, again, that's going to be the lesser of the net accumulated earnings or the amount that's invested in cash. Uh, to the extent that there's still accumulated earnings that haven't been subject to tax, uh, then the remaining is subject to that 8% effective tax rate. And then for C corporations, we're, uh, they're able to take a foreign tax credit for any underlying foreign taxes that have been paid by those foreign companies. But again, because the amount of tax that's being paid is less than the existing corporate rate, there's a pro rata reduction in the amount of those credits that are allowable. And then finally, if a company has uh, net operating loss carry forwards, they're able to uh, use those NOLs to offset the, the income inclusion that's going to result uh, from this transition. So the default rule is that NOLs will be offsetting and actually a taxpayer has to elect to not uh, have that NOL offset. So the, the issue or the, the question is in looking at this, you know, whether the, the value of the NOL, uh, especially at the new lower tax rate of 21% in future years, does that, uh, that, that benefit, how does that weigh against the, the cash tax cost of having to pay the, um, the transition tax on a current basis? or again, at least 8% of uh, that amount in the, in the current year. And then finally, in terms of looking at, you know, what are the opportunities um, kind of going forward, you know, the first, again, the first and foremost is what is the, uh, that tax on the deemed repatriation? Because again, that is a, an item that is going to affect 2017 tax returns, and that first payment is due on April 16th. And it's important to make sure that th those payments are made timely on um, over the deferral period because not making a deferral payment <clears throat> uh, results in a taxpayer losing their right to deferral and accelerates any remaining payments. So getting that first payment amount correct and getting it paid timely is going to be important to be able to maintain uh, being able to pay that amount over eight years rather than paying it all on April 16th. The second part is reviewing the impact of the new provisions. And again, particularly the, the guilty provisions as well as the foreign derived and tangible income provisions. Uh, these two could have a very large effects for um, companies with, you know, that are operating generally with, on large intangible assets and not much intangible assets, since both uh, impose kind of a baseline amount of um, income or return on tangible depreciable assets. And anything uh, ab above a 10% return on tangible depreciable assets uh, has, you know, U.S. tax effects. So looking at, you know, your existing operations and how both the U.S. company and the foreign entities earn income uh, will be important to understand what the effects of these will be, as well as on the guilty what is the effective rate of tax that's being paid on that income? And at least with the guilty, the, the amount is calculated on an aggregate basis across all foreign entities rather than on an entity by entity basis. So to the extent that there are some high, there's operations in high tax countries versus some in low tax countries, there is uh, some ability to kind of blend that income together to see if the effective tax rate does get above the 13.125% so that there's not a net uh, U.S. tax burden. And then finally, the, the last one, you know, after understanding kind of all of the effects of the provisions, you know, it, in, in any time there's any sort of major legislation change, it's always prudent to, you know, kind of review the existing structure, uh, both uh, on, a, on the tax side and um, on a legal entity side as well, to make sure that uh, what has been done in the past uh, still makes sense. Um, you know, everyone's talking about that this being the largest tax change since the 1986 Act. On the international side, this is really the largest fundamental change since 1962, so uh, when Subpart F was introduced. So going back, you know, more than 50 years in terms of kind of a, a extreme fundamental shift in U.S. tax policy with respect to uh, foreign operations, you know, it's obviously would then, you know, behoove a company to review its existing structures to see whether or not there needs to be any adjustments. 
And with that, I'll turn it over to Kanal to talk about uh, the effects on ASC 740. Kunal, I think you're on mute. All right, we seem to be having a little bit of a technical difficulty here. Sorry, Kunal, can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Um, so, sorry about that. Top of many corporations' minds here will be how to account for the changes in law in their financial statements. The tax and financial accounting will have pervasive impacts to all early and late stage technology and life science companies. Companies undoubtedly will face a challenge to account for the tax impacts of the tax reform in a compressed window of time. The accounting impact for the change in law will be recognized discreetly as a component of the tax provision in the period the change was enacted. So although many provisions in the 2017 Act become effective January 1, 2018, companies must account for the effect of the change in their 2017 financials. The SEC has issued guidance that does allow for a measurement period. There are many provisions that could impact tax accounting, but some of the key ones that we'd like to highlight for this industry is a change in applicable tax rate, which will require companies to remeasure deferred tax assets, accounting for the deemed repatriations of foreign earnings, Understand that companies will need to look at the deferred tax assets and what they look like after the law change and reassess if they have good assets that should be recognized on the balance sheet. A reminder for tax that a more likely than not threshold is used versus the probable and reasonable estimate assertions of FAS5. And of course, companies can expect to have added disclosures in their financials. The change in applicable tax rate for corporations from 35 to 21 percent means that going forward, certain timing differences will be reversing in a period with a reduced tax rate. These deferred tax assets will need to be remeasured at a rate expected to apply when the reversal occurs. If you are fiscal year company, you may have added complexity when it comes to analysis as a blended rate will need to be applied in the period because you will be straddling the 2017 and 2018 calendar years. This slide covers some of the impacts for the deemed repatriation. Roy gave us a very good overview of the provision, but wanted to highlight that if you do have a controlled foreign corporation, the tax will be assessed regardless of whether or not the company has cash in the CFC and regardless of whether or not the company intends to bring back the earnings. Depending on payment expectations, companies should consider if the tax is payable, should be classified as a current or non-current payable. Companies will also want to revisit what they intend to do with their foreign earnings, also known as the indefinite reinvestment assertion, as the cost of remittances back to the U.S. will generally be reduced. All these new provisions are likely going to require a company to take a second look at their valuation allowances that may or may not have been set up against deferred tax assets. In some situations where a company has significant earnings and profits overseas, and traditionally operated as a lost company in the U.S. and never had deferred tax assets on the balance sheet, the repatriation of those firm earnings may be greater than the tax attributes, such as net operating losses, and have a company in a position where they are recognizing deferred tax assets. The elimination of the corporate alternative minimum tax and the alternative minimum tax credits becoming refundable in 2021, companies that traditionally had valuation allowances against those credits should expect it to be released since there is no since those assets are now fully going to be refundable. If your company has no deferred tax assets but a deferred tax liability on its balance sheet related to indefinite live assets such as acquired intangibles with the federal net operating losses generated after 2018 not having an expiration period, you may expect to have an asset on your balance sheet up to the amount of liability. There are many other provisions outside of the ones listed here that may impact the scheduling analysis of future income projections. So with all these changes, companies can expect a lot of disclosures, 
Particularly, if you're going to make estimates during the measurement period, the SCC guidance is calling for a checklist of reasons to be disclosed around the size and nature of the adjustments being made and a reasoning why certain disclosures are incomplete and when, them, when you expect them to be fully accounted for. We touched on a handful of items today at a high level, but there are lots and lots of provisions in the tax law that will impact your financial statements. We have a couple of more items that we want to touch upon. So with that, Rich, I will hand it back over to you. Thanks, Kanal. So one of the things I just we wanted to wrap up, we've talked about the, the federal changes and they are there are a lot of them. Um, but it's always helpful to remember to think about the state implications of that. And with this, as I kind of alluded to in the introductory comments, um, state law um, sometimes follows federal law automatically and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so we put together this chart that um, kind of illustrates um, uh, how, how the states follow federal law. So the, the states uh, colored in blue, um, they, they generally automatically follow federal law um, uh, the states in red will follow federal law um, up through a certain point in time. Um, and, and the terminology that's used is uh, conformity, conformity with federal law. Um, uh, the states in, um, and, and the other states have, have the, in green and yellow um, have different provisions. Um, the states in, in white do not have a corporate income tax. Um, so we just wanted to remind people to, to not forget about whether or not the states are going to follow uh, the federal provisions. Um, also, because of these significant changes, um, you know, bonus depreciation and the international provisions, um, states might have to make exceptions, um, and we do expect a significant state legislative activity um, on their uh, uh, for on, in, on income tax. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, what else? What else haven't we talked about? As I mentioned um, early on, this was and has been repeated a few times. This is a broad, sweeping law. Um, we attempted to cover the primary um, provisions that are going to impact, impact uh, corporate taxpayers. Um, we did not cover literally over a hundred items, um, and I put them in here because they are broad um, and far-reaching. Um, and you, you might want to look through a couple of these, you know, these, this slide and the next slide uh, to see if you have any, anything that you should be looking at uh, in more depth. Um, you know, a lot of attention is given to the top you know, 10 or 20 items, but there's, there's uh, significant provisions throughout. Um, and, and we didn't have time to cover it all today. Um, if you, um, we do suggest that you um, continue to ask questions and, and look at your businesses. Um, we do have information out there to help um, a, a broader audience. Um, we just couldn't cover it all today. Um, so we, we should um, recommend that you stay up to date on, on tax reform. Um, we have a number of articles listed um, um, here and, and some upcoming webcasts um, and even some on-demand webcasts that you can access through our um, lossadams.com homepage. Um, and, and so you see the website link there. So we recommend that you, you look at that and, and review the information, a lot of good information there. Um, uh, and, and finally, to, to kind of wrap up, we will be sending out these slides to everyone so you'll have the link there. Um, and in just wrapping up, I'd like to thank um, uh, all my co-presenters. Um, if you have any questions, and there were a number of questions that came through, we didn't get to them all, and I apologize for that, but I knew we'd be uh, pressed for time. Um, we wanted to keep it at an hour because everyone is busy and has, has the regular job to take care of. Um, so if you have any questions, don't his, hesitate to reach out to any of us presenters or your individual um, uh, specific uh, Moss Adams tax advisor. Um, and with that, um, we're going to wrap it up, and thank you for joining. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to, to reach out, um, and hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everyone.